Hello, and welcome to today's show. I'm your host, Jonathan Clyde, owner of the Clyde Design Group, Fine Custom Cabinetry, where we design and manufacture out of the city of Oakland, California. And I'm also a real estate agent and have that background as well as a musical background as a conductor of orchestras around the world. But tonight, as I do occasionally, I'll be your host for this wonderful, wonderful event. And I plan to ask my guest this evening several questions, and I've got to tell you, the answers, or even one answer to these questions, may profoundly affect you. So keep listening, keep watching. And actually, I'd like to share with you the last question that I am plan to ask my wonderful guests this evening. And I'm going to read it to you, because I wrote them down carefully. And this question is, how do you think clearly about almost anything to determine the best action or course of action to execute in any situation. So, without further ado, so that we can draw upon the wisdom and the experience of my guest, it is my great, great pleasure to introduce my wonderful friend, Michael Killen. And Michael founded the international market and industry research firm, Killen and Associates, Inc before he was 30, and I think he actually ran that company for almost as many years. In addition to that, at a very early age, he also became and still is a wonderful, wonderful host of both television and radio. Michael Killen, welcome. Thank you for the fine <laughs> introduction, and you certainly have a good question there. I'm going to start thinking about it right now. Think, think about it. it. It was for you. But let me ask you a question to begin sure. our conversation. Because you led an organization, you're involved in the arts and business and corporations, you know leaders. Yeah. What is the most important thing to know about leadership? Who you are. Who you are. Yes. because. Every decision you want to make, you are reflecting on your background, your education, your environment, who you're married to. It is who you are which is the most important aspect of leadership. So as far as who you are, talk to me about, from your experience, what makes a great leader? I'd say a great leader needs vision and it's a person who is constantly looking out into the marketplace, into the world, into the team that supports him or her. You have to have vision to lead because vision is in the future, okay? And you also have to know where you are where the organization is. You also have to have vision with respect to anticipating how markets and situations are going to change. And again, what market are you in now? What resources do you have? So it's a lot about vision. So visionaries are? Our leaders. Our leaders. Right. And uh, they have to have a personality uh, again, to really know who they are. So within that context, Michael, what might be the most important decision that that person might ever have to make? Now, in that context, uh, now you put it in the business mm -hmm. world, but let me just say in life, the most important decision, in my opinion, is who you marry. I mean, that is the most important partnership. If you get it right, you have a partner who can help you for the rest of his or her life and your life. And if you don't make, have a good partner, you have problems. And you know, sooner or later, you have to, may have to invest the time to sever that partnership. So it, I believe the most important decision anyone can make is who they marry. Interesting. And I, I think I've also heard that from corporate leaders, big corporate leaders, that sort of echo your thoughts about that, that that was their biggest decision really? to their life partner. 
Really? Is actually, yeah. yeah. You have better vision than me because I have not ever heard a uh, leader say that, but, but that's good. I, I don't, I'm not the font of original, original thought. But you, you, you certainly have the wisdom. So within the context of business and our daily lives, which are so busy and there's so much information, you've done all these white papers and there's so much information just to gather. How would you tell people or what would you say to people that could help them learn the information in less time? Okay. Now, this comes from my own experience as a student and as, as a worker also. Um, I, very early in life, basically after high school and after, at best, a year or two in, in a junior college, and I set out to be successful and have a lot of event, adventures. And I took a, an approach of taking a job and staying on that job until I mastered the essence of it, until I started to repeat the work and I stopped learning and I started to feel comfortable with all the people working around me. And I immediately took another job and kept doing that, constantly putting myself in an environment where I had to learn quickly. I had to sort out the confusion that I found myself in. And I once read something what Descartes said, if you define your terms clearly, you will eliminate half of your confusion. So that's one part. It's the confusion goes away if you master the terms, if you get the definitions and you understand them. And it's good to try that, to see how it really works. But then I said to myself, what about the other half of the confusion? How do you, how do you learn and understand what's going on so that the, the rest of the confusion disappears? I don't know how I came up with this, but it I came up with the notion, the idea, if you can put whatever you're thinking about in a higher context, in a context that has meaning, much of the rest of that half of, of uh, confusion goes away. And I, I'd like to give you an example. You could study ants your entire life and learn a lot about them. But until you think of ants as part of a larger grouping, uh, bugs, okay? Once you can see something in that higher context, you suddenly have new knowledge about the ant. And later on, as I further thought about these ideas, I said to myself, if I could put now, we have a lot of camera people here, working here, and others. If I could understand what, what is in the context of that camera person's mind, what is in this person's mind, or anyone else, if I can see the ant or whatever in the context of how other people see it, I really get rid of a lot of confusion, and I gain a tremendous amount of insight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And since you've talked about things in your mind, talk with us a little bit about your mindset for success and how that affects you and your pathway. For me, success has always been two things. One, adventures. I feel we're here for some number of years, and the more event adventures we can have, the greater our experience in life. And related to that, the more professions and jobs I can have. Every time I have a new profession, it's like a new life, okay? So that's um, one aspect of it. And the other aspect that I've always tried to keep my mind on 
is my own financial future. I work and I use money that I made to both help create new adventures for me and to put money away to invest it so that when I get more old and decrepit and I can't take on these things, I will, I will go away um, nicely. So for people that are having these adventures and want to advance in these adventures, if let's say they're in the corporate world, how do they advance at a more rapid rate? Or, or if they're not in the corporate world, in any track of life, how do you advance quicker? Well, let's see. In my experience with people, with students, uh, and, and executives, there's a group of people who have this mentality and they have a job, you know, they're doing something important in a company that they will keep doing what they're doing. And if they see some new opportunity, a new need developing in the company, in the marketplace or somewhere, they, some of them are not inclined to go and take on that project. They tend to wait. Some of them wait to be asked or told to seize that opportunity. I have always lived by, and I don't know how come I'm like that, whenever I've been working in any environment, even when I ran, <laughs> when I ran companies, whenever I have seen something that is an opportunity and needs to be done, I just take it. I just, and usually it's a little higher up, I go and I start doing what is necessary to fill that need. And what almost always happens, all of a sudden, another department is moved under me. Right. Don't wait to be asked to do something important. Just do it. So it would, in turn, be the difference between active and passive. You're an active guy. Yes. Your, your mentality, your mindset is active as opposed to somebody sitting, waiting, or shying away who is just in the passive. And, and maybe I can give you an example that allowed me to advance very quickly as a very young man. I took a job in a company called Wang Laboratories that was on a real great growth uh, curve. And I had a limited education. And when I got hired, I was hired in the sales department, I think as a clerk, as I remember. And maybe they expected me to sort out sales, data, and whatever. You know, really not my kind of profession. And the day I reported to work, I went to my superior, a woman who worked for the national sales manager, and I said, I'm ready to work. And she said, hey, I got to tell you something. You are so green. Anyone coming in here is so green. We are so busy. We're going to keep paying you. But until we put you in a training program for about two weeks, and that'll occur in about two weeks, get lost. We'll keep paying you. You go, say, out of our hair. And two weeks passed. I got ready to go into the two-week training program. And they, they postponed it again because the training director was stuck somewhere, I think, in, in Egypt. And meanwhile, they were hiring more sales persons who had to go through this program. And so I continue to study the company, the people, and, and try to learn as much as I could, learn how to, the computer worked a little bit. And I get ready to go again. And again, they say he's now uh, somewhere in Kuwait or somewhere. And I could tell they're upset. So now I'm a new person in this company. And what I decided to do, I designed a training program for two weeks to train the salespeople. And I used my empathy or my understanding of what would I need. I had never sold sure. anything in my life. And I had never worked in education either. I designed a two-week training program. I put times down, topics down. And I identified people in the company who could do this. And on a Monday morning, I gave it to the national sales manager as he was walking down to meet with the chairman of the company. Make a long story short, a few days later, I was put in charge of the national education 
department for salespeople. That's terrific. I became the director of sales training within six weeks after I started the company. That's terrific. So again, another example of being very active and in that sense. So within that environment, or I guess any environment, whether it's people or corporations, what does your wisdom tell you about how you get a corporation or how you get people to do what you'd like them to do? Okay, I'll give you an example of, uh, well, this wouldn't be, you never go, let's say you want a job in, at Stanford, at NASA, the state of California, Google. When you go for your interview and they say to you, well, what would you like to do? A lot of people, and not just young people, say, I'd really like to design uh, driverless cars, or I'd like to help your company um, do something, you know. It's the I, I want. That's the killer. You know, in life, nobody really gives a damn what you want. Um, you want to always approach people or when they approach you and you want to do two things. Understand what they need and want and you do that by asking a lot of questions, as many as you can get away with. And then you always paraphrase what they say they need so they can hear and realize that you listen to them and then you say, well, I could help you do that. Always think about what they want and how you can help them and forget about what you want. But of course, you're not gonna take a job that you don't want. But if you wanna get that particular job over there, you articulate it in terms of helping them not fulfilling your own need. Great, great. Because I think a lot of people do approach it, what's in it for me? Mm. Which brings me then to the point of what, from your point of view, what era or kind of era, era are we living in? Well, I think uh, on the most fundamental level, um, we are still in the sustainability era. You know, we have, there are many errors, but I'd say the most profound is the sustainability error. We, we tend to realize, maybe we don't all realize this, but there's a lot of people on this planet. World has gotten very complex. You know, water is issues, climate is issues, energy is issues, human rights is issues. And we're doing our best to sustain ourselves and to keep just going, okay? But I think we have moved into also the resilient era, okay? Um, I think philosophers and people who really study what is happening, there is this realization that sustainability is not good enough. You know, we have these big, big storms, and I think if we were to list all the storms that are hitting us, Irma is about to hit us, uh, and that's going to cost us millions, billions of dollars. Uh, there are things like that happening. And resilient era is preparing for the hits and to be able to spring back from them. But then we can also say we're in the social media era, we're in the driverless car era, we're in uh, the era where we're starting to make the transition from fossil dirty fuels to clean fuels. We're, uh, we're in a lot of different eras right now. Right, no, that, that's, that's interesting. So from your point of view, since there's so much going on and I know how many messages that you deliver, um, what in your mind do you think is more important um, as we sit here today? Let's say if the choice were dreamers or, I don't know, climate change. What would, what would your take on that be? Well, what's important is from the perspective of, of uh, people. Like for dreamers, 
right now the most important um, thing on all of their minds is DACA, whether or not uh, the Congress or other forces are going to act and make sure the 800,000 wonderful human beings are allowed to stay and prosper in this great country. And also, from the liberals' point of view, the liberals of this country loves the dreamers and does not want anything adverse to happen to them. So depending on who you are, the dreamers are extremely important. Now, also to uh, many of the liberals and people with a very good education, especially a science education, they look at the threat of climate change and they see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of people living in a more difficult world. Okay? So it, what's more important is, I think, who you are, where you are. Mm -hmm. I tend to, as I think you know, I have great concern about the dreamers. I put myself in their shoes. I remember how difficult it was for me to get an education and to get a job and to prosper. I think in my life I didn't identify a mentor, an adult who helped me go forward until I was about 20 something years. So I, I identify with the dreamers. They don't need this mess, this threat yeah. And, uh, and then, as, as you know, I'm, I care very much about the growth of greenhouse gases, and I try to do my best, and the way I do my best as a, as a talk show host, television talk show host, and as a radio talk show host, I, in, I keep inviting the scientists, the government officials, the people in corporations who, who have the insight of, of what this threat of greenhouse gases means to us. Great. Well, this is such an interesting conversation and we're, we're, we're sort of getting toward the end now. But as you had mentioned mentors, which are teachers, which then bring me to a question I'm just very curious about. Um, how did you get involved in Stanford University? How did I get involved with Stanford University? In a way, I don't know. But I think it happened because they observed something that happened. Uh, NASA, when I started to paint, uh, very early on, they came, NASA came to me and said they were building the most energy efficient building in the world or the nation and called sustainability. And would I make a painting that would help bring attention to their good plan of building such a building and to the people who were going to, and the work they were going to do in this building. And I made a 24 foot painting for them, sustainability. I tend to think People at Stanford saw that. I'm not exactly sure how they did it, but shortly after I made that painting, I was invited to put that painting in the lobby of a very lovely building, the Ariaga Alumni Conference Center, right in the lobby, 24 feet, for their first Silicon Valley Energy Summit. Mm -hmm. So that started my relationship with Stanford. And then the next year, they uh, said, oh, you just painted Resilience of America. And they put it in their lobby. And then they yeah. asked me, what do you have for the next year? I've, every single Silicon Valley Energy Summit at Stanford has been my work. And then they came to me uh, relatively recently and said, Michael, you're a talk show host. How would you like to be a talk show host on our radio station, KZSU, Stanford Radio 90.1 FM? And, you know, I don't turn down opportunities. Sure. And, I, and at first I thought, well, maybe being a radio host would be, you know, a 
leverage my experience as a talk show host, having made, I don't know, 600 shows. And, and now I find I'm there, and it's very interesting, and it's a whole new world in a way. That's, ter that's terrific. Look, in the uh, couple of minutes that we have left, now that you've had a chance to think of the last question, and I know you've been thinking about that while you were talking, I'm going to read it to you again. No, I'd like that. Okay. How do you clearly think clearly about almost anything to determine the best action or course of actions to execute in any situation? We've got about a minute and a half. This is, to me, somewhat of uh, a topic having to do with critical thinking. And I think we all have to have to really critical think about anything. It's good to have a list of principles, like a principle, think about what's going on, and then say, go to that principle, concentrate on what matters most. Another principle might be the principle of operation. Make sure whatever you're going to do, you have the money, the bank account, or, or whatever to do. Maybe you think about the principle or the element of, use the element of surprise to magnify the rep uh, resources implied. So for critical thinking, I think everyone should have a list of principles. Now, and how do we use those principles? It's very good to have in your mind a model of the situation that you're in, to be able to sort, sort resources, restraints, threats, and opportunities. You and I right now, we have resources, restraints, and opportunities, four element threats right here, okay? And we can think about what's going on and put them in those different categories. That's the present. And we want to go somewhere in the world where we, there are less threats, more resources, more opportunities, and less restraints. I think it's important to have a model of the situation. And then you can think about that data of, for each of them and feed them into your principle. And Napoleon gave me this idea. And One, one he, last sentence. He said, when I can view a situation through a body of principles, I gain a special view of what to do. Michael Killen, you've given us wisdom, as you always do. You're terrific. It has been my pleasure to host this program today. I'm Jonathan Clyde. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.